Hey everybody, good evening, and welcome to my Instagram live launch. Amina, hi. Hi everybody. Hey, my dad just joined. So we're going to vamp a little bit, and my friend Anna Shinoda is going to join me in just a moment. Um, so, oh hey, Nick, Michael. Hey everybody. Gabriella. It's really exciting to see you all, and uh, I can't wait to celebrate my new book with you. So good to see you. Hi, Melanie. This is like Romper Room. Do you guys remember Romper Room, where at the beginning, the lady would say hi to everyone, and I never got my name mentioned. And to be honest, I, I still resent that. Hi, Rachel. My agent, Rachel, is here. Cousin Jenna. What's up? Oh, hey, I see Adam. Yeah, my hair's getting longer. Evelyn Sky, hi Evelyn Sky, author Evelyn Sky is here. It's very exciting to see you all. How are you guys doing? How are you coping with this uh, incredibly nasty situation? Oh, Nick's here. Hi, Nick. My Uncle Don. Gosh, the whole family's showing up. This is awesome. Hi, cousin Jenna. It's so exciting to see you all. There are icons on the bottom of the screen that I don't know what they do. Go live with, oh, I see, that's exciting. Awesome. Hi, Marisa. That's good to see you guys. Are those all of your books? Yeah, well, some of them. These are the Harry Potter books. I didn't write those. This is my brand new book, The Lightness of Hands, that just came out on Tuesday. Isn't it beautiful? I'm so excited. This a little tidbit to get you started is the RV that I toured in, in my rock band 7k. Uh, they took a photo that I sent them and made it just like this. So exciting. All right. And this is my first book. You may recognize symptoms of being human. Melanie, you finished it already. Wow. That's awesome. Yes. My dad is reminding me that the lightness of hands is number one in YA right now. You can't hear me. Can anybody else hear me? Is anybody having trouble hearing me? Evelyn can hear me. That's so cool. All right. Um, cool. Well, I guess while we're waiting for Anna to get free and join me, um, does anybody have questions? You can type in questions into the, uh, into the question box. I guess I should, for those of you who don't know me well, my name's Jeff. And I wrote a, a book called Symptoms of Being Human that came out in 2016. And my new book, The Lightness of Hands, just came out. And it's about Ellie, who is 16, and she has to battle her bipolar 2 disorder as she attempts to resurrect her sick father's ruined magic career. So it's about magic and mental health and father-daughter bonding and the way we keep the ones we love. It's very exciting. All right, I'm gonna text Anna and just make sure we're on the same page here. All right. What inspired the father-daughter story? Let's see. Well, my dad was a magician. Um, and so I grew up in the realm of magic. Um, many Sundays, mornings at brunch, I would spend at the Magic Castle, which is a private magic club in Hollywood. And I would see some of the best magicians in America and from all over um, perform their best tricks. And I was about 10 years old when I approached my dad and I said, hey, uh, I want to learn some magic. And he told me two things. He said, one, you can't tell anyone because that's the magician's code. You can't tell people how it's done. And two, you're going to be really disappointed when it happens and uh, when you learn the secret. And he was right. He taught me and I felt totally ripped off. And I stopped learning magic from there. Hi, Anna. Hi. You're going to laugh. I was... Um... I wasn't following you on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know that you'd gone in, but I thought I was already following you. And so uh, now I'm super embarrassed. I'm late to the party. You, but were, you here, were following here my am. cat. 
Yes, I was following your cat and not you. That's you hilarious. Know. Well, welcome to it. Your hair looks amazing. Thank you. You know, it's, uh, we were talking earlier about like some things that we didn't have to do because we're not going actually in person somewhere tonight. Um, I only did the front of my hair. So the back is not done. My wife trimmed my hair uh, and I think she did a fantastic job. She but did. the top has gotten so long, I used maybe two ounces of hair product. So nice. it will take me a while to wash this out. Oh, you know. The other thing, by the way, is I'm, I'm in my slippers. I'm wearing my Nightmare Before Christmas slippers. Oh, I love it. Mm, yeah. Ooh, can you see right here in the background? That's Jack Skellington in his Santa hat. And that's the back of oh. Sally's head. We have Very nice. We, uh, we are proper nerds, you and I. We are hey, before, proper. Before, that's right. Before we get started, I wanted to talk about how we're going to do the giveaway tonight. So at the very end uh, of this broadcast, we're going to do a giveaway of three amazing books. Uh, actually, four, if Anna's willing to donate one of hers. Girl, oh, yeah. I... You are? Okay. Awesome. Oh, talk about that. My book? My yeah. cover? So, by the way, not only am I donating one of mine, here it is. But since I live with the person who illustrated the cover, we both signed it. So um, Mike, Mike is my husband, and he made this beautiful cover. Um, and uh, so I, I signed, we both signed it for you. And I actually have two for you. So we can do two giveaways, not just one. Oh, that's exciting. I Very love exciting. it. Or I could win the other one, and then you could just. Or I could just give you a copy that's signed by both. Like, you don't have to win it. Someday when that. we get to have dinner again with our writer's group, which is how we met. That's right. We met in a writer's group. I want to say it's somebody's launch at, um, was it the Grove? I want to say it was Carrie's launch for First Time We Drown, maybe. Maybe. Speaking of First Time We Drown, that is one of the books I'm giving away tonight. I didn't even know that. The First Time We Drown by Carrie Clutter, an amazing, dark, beautiful literary novel about mental health. I love yes. it. Um, this is my friend Marisa Reichardt's debut novel, Underwater. It's incredible. It's about a girl who is uh, essentially can't leave her apartment. She can walk out onto the balcony and that's about it. And uh, then the world draws her out. And this is- I have is... not read that one, by the way. And I have not read this one either, either. I've oh read my God. Carrie's, but not. You have to. So this is Girl in Pieces by Kathleen Glasgow, New York Times bestseller. Um, she blurbed my latest book. This book is, this is one of those books where you read it and you wish you had written it, you know? Um, but it's just, I mean, it's a literary book. It's so good. So here's what's going to happen. Uh, since the theme of my book is magic, I have here a deck of playing cards, bicycle, rider back playing cards. These are manufactured by the U.S. Playing Card Company in Cincinnati, Ohio. And right now I'm going to shuffle the cards my dad will be embarrassed at how poor my ruffle sh my sh riffle shuffle has become. Oh. I'm, I'm gonna cut the deck. Okay. That was awful. Say it was terrible. Let's try <laughs> that again. Here, I'm gonna do it sideways. Not as bad. Okay, so I'm gonna cut the deck once. I'm gonna draw this card. I'm not seeing it, you're not seeing it. I'm gonna stick it right there. And then as a backup, I'm gonna draw two more cards and we'll explain this at the end. So I'm gonna cut the deck one more time. And the top card goes right here. And just in case I need a third backup, cutting the deck, this card goes up here. So at the end of the night, we will discuss how that game will work. But in the meantime, the cards are in plain view. All right. Okay. That's this all I've got. Very, very exciting. Very, very exciting. Okay. So um, did you talk a little bit about your book before I came in? Or can I talk about it? I gave them the gist, but a lot of people have showed up. So why don't you okay. go ahead? Okay, so um, the book is about Ellie is the main character and she and her dad are, um, he, he was once famous, he's no longer a famous magician and they are really on hard times. They live in an RV and it's beat up, it's run down. They barely have enough money to just get by. And, um, the story gets more complicated when they run out of money and 
Ellie can no longer afford her uh, bipolar medication, and her dad also um, can't afford his heart medication. So they ha she basically has to make a choice between food and her dad's heart or her mental health. And she chooses to not get her medication. And that is what complicates the story. Um, but really, the story is an adventure about her trying to turn things around for her and her father and them traveling together cross country. She says yes to a gig she knows he's going to say no to. And um, she kind of has to like finagle and lie her way. But for the best, for, for the best thing for her and her dad. And so she's doing all these things, but it's really for the best um, for their family. And um, the thing that I love about it is it is certainly a book about health and mental health, but that is just the thing that complicates the book. And I feel like that's such a real way of looking at mental health because um, sometimes mental health isn't just like, it. Uh, most of the time, mental health isn't like just the forefront thing of your life. It's something that can complicate your life, but it's not what you and everybody is, uh, and everything about you is, is about. So that's going to lead me into my first question, unless you have something to add. That was well done. I have nothing to add. Counselor. Fantastic. Okay. So when we write, um, sometimes we have to do research. Sometimes the experience comes from our own lives. Um, so I'm going to ask you a few questions about research on lives, both combination. Um, I've done a lot of road travel. I've done a lot of road travel with my husband because in Lincoln Park, he's traveled everywhere. And I've been together with him for 20 years. But before that, my, um, I was the youngest of seven kids. I had family in Ohio, in Texas, in Florida, and in uh, Washington. So if, I wanted, if we wanted to see our family, we would just all pile into a car and go across country. So the road travel descriptions in your story are so great. I mean, <laughs> the truck stops, like praying for the good shower, uh, praying yeah. for a clean bathroom, um, yeah. you know, going in and all the little like snacks and stuff that you get when you're trying to kind of make a meal out of whatever you can. Um, so was that a uh, personal experience, research, or both? Yeah, so I toured with a rock band of my own called 7K um, in a beat-up RV, um, mostly in the Midwest and the East Coast. And I really felt that was always niggling at me that I wanted to put it in a book. Um, it's just, you know, it's such a glamorized thing, and it is – such a high to be on the road and just constantly be moving and to have events after event. Um, but it's also incredibly brutal and incredibly isolating. You, you know, there's this thing called the blur where you, you wake up and you don't remember what town you're in or what day it is. And for us, this was before cell phones were, you know, something you always had, you'd get up in the morning you know, and a lot of times we parked the RV in a Walmart parking lot because the guy who founded Walmart was an RV guy and he allowed you to park there. And I'd get up and I'd walk into the RV and I'd walk into the Walmart and there on the wall of the Walmart was like, welcome to the Tulsa Walmart. I go, oh, Tulsa, right. Okay, right. We were in Norman, Oklahoma last night. And then you're right. You, you know, you can stock up the fridge in the RV, but at some point, you know, you, you stop at the convenience store and it's beef jerky and a banana and you feel like you've hit the food groups. So, so... Right. That part, that part of the book was definitely from my personal experience. I didn't have to do any research. Interestingly enough, the research I did have to do was what was the price of diesel now? How far could a gas tank take you? Which town, which cities could they get to? Where would they have to stop? Um, and my copy editor actually really helped with that. She was she's like, no, this would only take you this far. So they'd have to stop here. And uh, so that was really fun, actually, doing that part of the thing. Copy editors are amazing. Oh they found God. so many, like, hey, but wasn't it sunny 10 minutes ago? And right. what about this? What about that? The timing doesn't work. So they, they are truly, they pull all the threads together, I feel like. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so second question of personal experience versus research. Um, for you've already talked a little bit about you do have a little magic background. Uh, you know a little bit about magic. Um, and did you ever perform doing magic? Yes, my dad and I used to perform in my hometown every year. They did a benefit for brain injured children, and we would do we would perform an illusion called linking rings. And you may be familiar with it. The magician has three rings. He links them together and shows you that they're connected and then magically he pulls them apart. It's a classic trick. And my dad and I would do it, but we did it in this sort of cheesy father son way where he would, you know, he'd be downstage performing the trick and I would be trying to get the rings apart and not being able to do it. And then he'd turn around and I'd go, oh, look, I, I got them back together. So it was this cheesy sort of like vaudevillian shtick. Um, and it was a lot of fun. Oh, super fun. Um, so why for this book did you decide to do magic instead of music? Because with a road right. trip story, you could have done either or. Right. Um, the seed was actually planted by an agent who rejected my book. Um, so the third manuscript I wrote was a dystopian fantasy. I loved it. I couldn't wait to get it out there. It was about music. Um, and I, I don't know if Rachel knows this. Oh my God, my agent's going to hear my secret story. <laughs> so I, a friend of mine worked for an agency and she was, um, so kind to aggressively get my manuscript to the agent. And the agent said, I can't sell this book. You've missed the dystopian window, but I had, so I'd written my, when you're unpublished and you write a bio, you try to make your bio sound interesting any way you can, because <laughs> everyone lives with their pets in a town and, you know, has a degree in something or whatever. Um, so I had opened my bio with, I was born the son of a magician and a banker, because my mom was a banker at the time. And so this agent was like, you wrote something about your father being a magician, write about that. And oh, Rachel does know this story. So I was like, no, I don't want to, you know, all right, I'll pitch her something. So I made up this story and pitched it to her. And she's like, I'll sign you on that. And I was like, nope, I want to sell my book that I already wrote. So I said no to her. But all in the back of my mind, then was like, oh, I should write a story about magic. Um, and then I wrote um, my first book and uh, or my, my first book that published and um, my agent uh, got me a two book deal. So when that book was done, I was like, what am I going to do? I wrote two other books that crashed and burned. And then about two years, so, wow, I'm really rambling now, but this is all relevant. It's all good. Keep going. So, so Symptoms came out in February of 2016. If you back up two months in the middle of December of 2015, I met my kids for the first time and took them into our house and started the adoption process. Two months later, my book came out. I quit my job. I became essentially a stay-at-home dad slash writer. So my life just changed in a moment fast forward about a year and a half i found myself in the middle of the worst mental health crisis mm -hmm. uh in my life it was the probably the lowest point in my life and i kept you know i was like i have a beautiful family i have the career of my dreams and i didn't think my life was worth living and i was i you know the all, when you're that low it's hard even to reach out or call someone. I, I can't explain it, but it just doesn't yes. seem worth it. It's yeah. just, um, and I'm really lucky. Um, I was sleeping on the couch one night just because I couldn't sleep. I didn't want to keep my wife up. And she just came downstairs and she was like, what is going on? And I think the only thing I could say is I need help. Um, and the thing I, the thing I want to, get across to people is so I have the best health insurance you can have. My wife is a teacher. Um, I have amazing health insurance. The amount of fighting I had to do to get an appointment with a qualified psychiatrist was crazy. You know, I could get a, I could get a, an appointment with somebody local who could see me for 15 minutes and I just knew that wasn't going to cut it. And so I got a referral to the attending at a local um, psych hospital and I called and he was booked for 10 months and I called every month. And finally, I just got on the phone with somebody and they said, yeah, he's booked until, you know, February. And I said, I'm, I might not be here in February. And I kind of like broke down. He was like, all right, I'll get you in. And luckily that guy 
is the one who diagnosed me with bipolar. Bipolar 2 is really hard to diagnose. It gets diagnosed as major depressive disorder and it gets treated with antidepressants and you give a bipolar person antidepressants and they finally feel good enough to take their own life. Um, and I had been misdiagnosed 10 years ago, had that experience and swore off medication altogether. Um, and this guy got it. I mean, he spent an hour with me, which is unheard of for a psychiatrist. So to answer your question, well, I don't remember what your question was, to be frank. <laughs> um, my question, this is where I, I did, wait, did I get to, um, no, I, we were talking about music instead of magic. Right. And then I think, did, did I actually ask, uh, personal experience because your main character has bipolar and that was that was what I was going to ask you next but I think you just you just launched in and actually you you launched in and you answered so many questions that I was going to ask which is great and we're gonna pick I, I want to go in depth in a lot of the things you were just talking about because there are so many important points that you just made um, but, uh, but, but uh, why music instead of magic was because, or why magic instead of music was because um, your, your agent had said. Yeah, and I, I wanted to, to, to go do. For it. Oh yeah, and that's, you were in the middle of talking about that and then you talked about like your, your um, break. Yes, but you, but we're getting there. <laughs> we're imagine, getting back to Im it. imagine me trying to outline a book with this attention span. So. Um, so that, that agent put the thought in my head and I was going to try to write a, um, a mad, a, mu a music story. So I actually had that in my mind. And then it occurred to me that what would really be great is a magic story that was a father daughter. And originally my thought was that, that dad was going to die pretty early on in the novel and that um, the daughter was going to have to carry on without him. And there was going to be some kind of mystery to solve. I don't remember. Um, but then, so I started drafting and dad just kept sticking around and sticking around. And I really liked him. And I really liked how complicated their relationship was. And I, I just kept writing and he survived longer and longer and longer. And the story changed. So, um, I'm going to jump to a different question than about that because you just brought up a father daughter story. Um, for your first book, Symptoms of Being Human, your first person point of view, and it's a gender fluid main character. For this book, it's pers first person point of view, and it's a female who identifies as female. Um, was this story, did you try this story with a male main character or was Ellie always female? Where, did you put thought into it other than you knew that, I mean, you just said you wanted it to be a father-daughter book. So was that where that came from? Or was there thought put into it? Or was it just like, yep, she's, it's, it's the story about Ellie and her dad. I've thought a lot about this, about why I write outside my gender identity because the book I'm working on right now has a female protagonist and I just don't know. I don't have a good answer for that. I don't spend a lot of time, this is gonna sound horrible, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about what I write. I find thinking like counterproductive to the creative process. I have to get past my thinking to write. Like thinking, I always think of the creative life as you have a creative brain and a critical brain and they're both they're both necessary to write but you can't engage them both at the same time and so i save my critical brain for revision um and so when i'm writing i just i it's really instinctual um and only later do i go back and think about it so i don't know why i've chosen um those protagonists. I don't have a good answer mm. for that. I was actually wondering because um, when I wrote Learning Not to Drown, I, the, the main character was always female, but um, I needed to do something to make her different enough for me that it wasn't my story. So yeah. what I did is I had her sneak out. And as soon as I wrote the scene where she snuck out, like I would have never slept out because I was too good of a, of a, 
person growing up. <laughs> yeah. I was like the, the like rule follower. I would have never snuck out. So as soon as I did that, it wasn't about me anymore. And then I felt like I could freely write the story. Um, oh, I, I do have one thing. So th I started writing this right at the peak of the Me Too movement. And I, women in magic are so objectified. Like it's almost like dance. And so I did, I did want to deal with how different it would be for a, essentially a late stage boomer and a m late stage millennial to deal with how different their realities were of magic. And um, in the original draft, Ellie had a lot more problems with uh, being objectified by audience members. I sort of peeled it back because it ended up feeling like a tangent. But I thought that was a really interesting obstacle that I wanted to explore. As I talked about Me Too with the women in my life, the thing that shocked me was how much they took it for granted and how it just kind of swept over them like, why would I make a big deal about this stuff? If I did, I would be, I'd spend all my days worrying and thinking about it. And that surprised me. And so I kind of wanted to like, imagine what that would be like and put myself in those shoes. That was a fascinating thing. So maybe that's part of the reason why I wrote a few more times. I don't know. Right. Okay, so uh, going back to personal experience research, um, you have bipolar. And I was wondering when you were doing this, um, we, we were not when you were doing this, but when, when I was reading the book, I was learning a lot about bipolar. Um, I do have some friends who also have bipolar, but I felt like it was, um, my first experience of really like walking in somebody else, being in the mind, walking in somebody else's shoes. And I, and I love that. Um, your, uh, did you, do you have some of the same symptoms that your main character has or did you do research for that or is it kind of a combination of the two like there's like the song stuck in her head or um oh the song stuck in your head i have such an interesting story about that yeah. so when i got diagnosed my psychiatrist started with okay you're depressed now when was the you know they ask you questions to determine if you if you've experienced mania like hey when do you ever have a weekend where you just don't sleep do you ever have and i was like oh yeah this and when i'm up and uh and then he goes back and then he goes back well how about what was the last one cycle oh i was in my you know oh god i was in my mid-30s so how about before that late 20 and you go oh my god and your life starts to make sense and every time you changed a job and every time a relationship got wrecked and it was just like oh my god this has been derailing my life and so that um that experience led me to what it would be like because i'm slow cycling i'm like 12 18 months um ellie cycles much faster than i do and and a lot of people cycle fast and by cycle i mean they go from a depressive episode to a hypomanic episode to a prep you know the it's like the wavelength um and i I chose faster cycling uh, for dramatic reasons because I wanted to show that ride. Um, Ellie, I want to say, goes through two or three full cycles over the course of a novel, which only takes 10 days, and that's fast cycling. Um, uh, but the other thing that I, 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 oh, the music, the song getting stuck in your head. So one time, so I, I, I realized that I was starting to pay attention to my mind. I, I started meditating, doing mindfulness meditation, and that really helped. But I started paying attention to my mind, and I realized I basically wake up in the morning and have a song in my song cycling, some small phrase of a song cycling in my head until I go to bed. And it's, it can be very distracting and irritating. And I finally, oh my God, that's happening every day. And I asked my psychiatrist about it. I said, is that normal? And his answer, I will never forget, he said, we don't really know much about what's normal. And I was like, what? And he said, yeah, we only know what people complain about and what interrupts their life. And he said, you're a musician, so maybe it's because you're a musician or maybe that's why you became a musician. I don't know. So that is definitely something I suffer from. Um, it's the most irritating song, the catchiest song will get stuck in my head and I'm having a conversation with me, with them and all I hear is, I came in like a wrecking ball over and over and over again. 
So that's for sure me. That's for sure you. That's yeah. not necessarily like a, a bipolar in general thing of having a, a song that plays I, on repeat. I don't know. You have no idea. I did um, see one but, question pop up in the comments. I'm not really paying attention to the comments, but yes, I take medication every day. Absolutely. Could not do this without being on medication. I want to talk a little bit about medication because, um, well, first of all, there's two really important things about this that I wanted to, um, I want to read a quote actually. Um, so she says, I brought dad to tears and I driven Ripley away. If that's who I was off meds, wasn't that the real me? Didn't that make the medicated functional version of me nothing more than a chemical marionette? Did the illness disfigure my personality or did the medication build me a false one? I didn't know which Ellie was real. I just knew I didn't like her. Um, I read that and it's something I think that uh, most people who um, have different levels of mental illness will feel like, who am I? And and um, your book has this theme of identity. It has a theme of, you know, um, of her identity as a magician and her identity of, as someone who has bipolar and how those two things butt up against each other. Um, her identity as a teenager, but also her identity as kind of being her dad's caregiver. Um, so there's a lot of things about identity in this, but one of the biggest ones is the question of um, how mental illness is a part of us, but yet not getting to the point where it becomes our sole identity. Um, so I wanted to ask you about, um, and, and well, and this is more of, I'm just going on about how great I think that it is that you're bringing it up because I have had friends who will go off of their medication because they feel like mm, this isn't me or this isn't, um, the real me or who, who am I in all of this? Yeah. You feel good and you start to wonder, are the side effects worth it? And then you right. go off it and you forget that medication helped and yada, yada. Right. And so um, another part of it is I think how we do word choice when we're talking about mental illness with identity. And um, you make a point in this book where she's having a conversation and she says, I'm bipolar. And the person she's having a conversation with says, I like to say I have bipolar. Because there's a, and there's a big distinction between I am bipolar and I have bipolar. And I wanted to talk to you about the importance of word choice with mental health, because I feel like Nobody would say I am coronavirus <laughs> or I am cancer, <laughs> right? But yet when it comes to yeah. mental health, for yeah. some reason, that word sneaks in to our word choice. Um, was that something when you were writing that, was that something that you had had like a moment of like, no, I, this is not what I am. This is just something I have. Or was it just you were writing and that came out. Was it, was it thought, thought about? It's funny. You actually taught me about word choice it, when we were, I sent my author's note to you and you gave me some really great um, comments about how I talked about, particularly about suicide and about my feelings of life being worth living. Um, you know, being precise about language is, really important when you're a writer and it's really important when you're an advocate for me i think when i got diagnosed i identified so much with what had just happened to me that i wanted to claim i am bipolar and then as i started to um recover is not the right word because you don't recover from bipolar disorder it's something you manage for the rest right. of your life um i needed to own it 
and take ownership of it. And I think when the character that's speaking to Ellie, I don't want to give it away because it's kind of a plot point. When, when the character is discussing it, that's kind of a mentor moment. He gives her that gift of saying, you are not, it's not an identity, it's a diagnosis. Um, so there you go. There we have it. But I loved that. I, I really, I felt that that was such an important thing um, to say and, and for people to start thinking about. Um, you know, I hate the word recovery. I just, I, I, I hate the word recovery because it implies an injury. And those of us who deal with, um, you know, fairly crucial psychiatric disorders, we, don't, we can treat it, but we don't get better. And I, I hate the expectation that it's how something, something that if I just exercise enough or whatever, that I'm going to get over it. It doesn't, right. it's not how it works. And I, I want to like shout that from the rooftops. It's a chronic thing. It's not a, if I just get outside and get enough sunshine, I'll feel better. Yeah. And we there, is, there is, talking, uh, sorry. I was just going to say, we were talking about that earlier before we came on tonight, you and I, yeah. about how like, we're both with, all this going on and being socially isolated and you were like how are you doing and i'm like i'm doing fine now but hold on to my hat when they say it's safe to go outside my anxiety is going to be something else and so for me it's it's like being prepared for that and knowing like um this is what this is what's coming and i know the things that i have to do to take care of myself and one of the things that i wanted to talk to you about is having a plan um because uh one of the um things that you were just talking about with it is a lifelong thing going to always have to deal with it but when you are feeling at your worst, that is the least likely time that you're gonna say like, hey, I'm gonna reach out for, for some help. So right. do you have a plan or some things that you do when you start feeling like, mm, I've got to take care of this. I know that this is going, going someplace that you would wanna share a little bit about. If not, that's fine too. Yeah, yeah, so I realized at about 10 a.m. today that I am, full blown in hypomania right now. And it, of course it's happening because my book is launching and I'm really excited. Um, but I realized about 10 a.m. today, like I had this major story breakthrough on not the thing I'm working on, but the thing after the thing I'm working on. And like, I've been babbling tonight, like you asked me a question and I just go off and go out like that's a symptom. And uh, I haven't been able to sleep without help, without pharmaceutical help. so. I know that either next week or the week after I'm going to crash. And so the first thing I have to do is alter my expectations. Like I'm not going to get work done that week. My, I will be probably a little irritable and, uh, and withdrawn. Um, so, so my plan is to you know sit down with my wife and kids and say, hey, listen, the next two weeks are gonna be difficult for me and I really need your patience. And I apologize in advance if I snap. And um, I'm going to watch a lot of movies. And I'm going to read a lot of books. I'm going to try to go outside. I'm going to try to keep exercising. Sometimes it's really hard. Um, but the other thing that I want to say about both hypomania and depression, particularly hypomania, is that it doesn't always manifest itself as high and, and happy and constructive. Oftentimes I'm irritable and impatient and I just don't, I want to deal with your crap and I get out of my way. And, um, and that's really hard because people don't see that as illness. They just see it as you being an asshole. Right. And so your personality is disfigured um, by it. And I, you know, my wife is a saint because she'll be like, you're all right. You're okay. You need some moment. You need to go, go be alone with yourself. So I have a very good husband when it comes to um, him knowing to what's going on with like, like sometimes he'll just be like, 
how long has it been since you talked to Sue? That's my therapist. And I'll be like, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> thanks. So it's showing up, I see. But, um, and mine is anxiety and depression. That's the two things that I um, have um, to just constantly keep on top of. Um, I wanted to talk, we're already at 640. So oh I want, uh, how much time do you need at the end for the giveaway, by the way? Uh, let's do it at 10 minutes or okay. eight, eight minutes, maybe. Okay, so um, two things that you talked about um, that I just wanted to like put a little point on. You, in this book, there is the reality of barriers. Um, and, I, and I love that there's a reality of barriers because you might not be able to see a therapist. You might not be able to afford your medication. Um, you uh, may have, um, it, suddenly something happens in your life that it kind of throws the whole plan off of everything, right? Um, I don't wanna give anything away of what, what, is, what happens in the book. But like there are things, there's a lot of stuff that happens. And um, right now I feel like already we were in a situation where a lot of people couldn't afford healthcare, they can't afford their medication. And now we are in a really scary time where people are losing their, their jobs. And um, what is your feeling do you have, I'm, I'm not an expert in this, so do you have any thoughts about um, resources and things for people who have that barrier of not being able to afford their medication or not being able to get in? I mean, I know that you said like, listen, I'm not gonna make it eight months or whatever it was, so I need to be seen now. But do you have any, um, any other advice, I would say? And if you don't, that's okay too. We can both say we're not, psychologist or psychiatrist yeah so in the back of the in the back of the book i actually list five or six resources there there are some chat lines now because it's hard sometimes to talk um there are some chat help lines where you can just get on um and and have somebody sometimes it's hard sometimes it's hard to talk to your friend well can you hear it like i'm running words together oh sometimes it's hard to talk to your friends and your family because it's embarrassing so yes. those chat lines really help. Um, but honestly, my recommendation is that while you are healthy, um, while you are well, and while you have medication, to build healthy habits. Um, uh, and for me, it's meditation, exercise, getting outside, going to bed on time, drinking enough water, eating healthy. I like to think of myself as a high performance machine and I need the best fuel. And I need oh, I a like lot that. of maintenance instead of being a broken thing. I'm like a Ferrari. You can't just pump 87 <laughs> into a Ferrari and pull out of your driveway. You, have to you can't it. use the cheap gas in Ferrari. You've got to right. put the best in. So, uh, so if you can build those habits when you're well, it's easier to say to yourself, oh, those are, I just got to keep doing that um, and make that your only expectation of yourself. Um, if you can float through your job and just, and just be like, okay, I'm going to have some blah days. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hit anything out of the park. I'm going to have very low expectations. That helps too. Um, okay. I want to ask you, there were people, people gave questions and I want to ask you a couple more. Um, one thing that I just wanted to bring up to anybody who is going to read The Lightness of Hands, um, it is really, there, there is um, suicide in here. And one of the questions, and it's not a, um, I'm, going, I'm going to say that there are themes of suicide and self-harm, okay? It's not um, a tragedy. It's not a tragedy. It's, it's it not a tragedy. Me. It is a hopeful book. And um, one of the things, one of the questions was, is it safe for everyone to read this book? This was a question that came in on my Instagram earlier today. And my, my feeling about this is, um, I believe, know what you're, that you're gonna be reading something that, that's a little heavy, but I feel like there is so much good to this and there's so much relatable to it. Um, and so much helpful to it that I would not want somebody to shy away from it just because there is self-harm and um, suicide themes in this book. Um, 
That said, I always say to uh, know yourself and um, I, I would say make a safe place to read is, is what my suggestion would be. Do you have any other um, thoughts or suggestions on that? No, it's tough. Like the, the publisher really wanted to put a trigger warning at the beginning and I get it. Um, I, I think there's a trade off with trigger warnings. I think people who aren't sensitive to what's inside then hyper focus on the thing that was warned. Um, I pay attention to what I'm about to read. I read up if I if I think it's going to be tender. I always recommend people do that. Um, you know, an artist can't be held responsible for how people respond to what they read. And if you're prone to being really affected by those things, then for sure, you know, look into what you're reading. That's, that's my advice. I know it's kind of a, it's not the most sensitive take, but I think that's really important as a self care thing. Don't wait for someone else to tell you if it's tender. This person asked, they, you know, they asked someone who had read it. That's exactly what you should do. Yeah. Um, what languages is it going to be coming out in? So is far, it... just English. Okay. Um, it hasn't been translated. Okay. So just English. Um, but your other book, Symptoms of Being Human, is out in? Uh, Which... English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Uh -huh. um, oh, it's out Turkish. now. Well, it was bought. It was Turkish rights were sold, but I don't know if it's been published. Um, and it is. And this book is out now as of this week. Um, your for people who can't afford to get it, libraries will most likely have the book or you can request it at your library. Yes. And I've never, um, I never used an online library until today when my kids had to do it for their library assignment. But uh, the public libraries in the United States, you can use your library card. And what app are you using? Because they're using one called Sora. I use an um, app called Libby and they not only have like ebooks that you can check out, but they have uh, audiobooks. So you can check out the audiobook, download it, and listen to it. And I do that at least once a month. And let me see if there's another. Oh, did you have a favorite? Oh, this will be a nice way of ending this, I think, um, because I'm gonna sh I'm gonna share with you my favorite quote. It's a little bit of a it's a little like sad, but I thought like it was the best way that anybody um, has ever. Um, described depression ever. Wow, Ooh. thank Ooh. you. Um, but uh, somebody asked, what's your favorite part of your story or phrase that means a lot to it, to, to you? So is there a favorite part of this book where you like wrote it and you went like, yeah. Yeah, there's a part where Ellie's up and she says something to the effect of when when I feel like this, it's hard to tell what's sense and what's sickness and why bother when you feel so good. Mm. And I think that I'm constantly doubting myself is, is this really sickness or am I just using it as an excuse? It's so hard to, mm. to parse when are you really sad or when are you really happy or creative because it's sickness? And the truth is it doesn't matter. That's the state you're in. And if you're taking care of yourself, you know, everyone has good and bad days. And unfortunately, when you have a really bad or a really good day, that's everyone, no one wants to suffer and no one wants to be embarrassed and no one wants to think about how hard it would be if they had what you had. So they will minimize it. And, um, that frustrates the shit out of me. Stop doing that if you're doing that to your friends. Um, but that line really captures for me, is it sense or is it sickness and how do you know and why does it matter? Mm, I love that. Okay, mine is um, this quote. People think depression is the same as sadness, a blue gauze that descends to tint everything a shade darker. But in truth, it's like a snowfall of ash obstructing the color and the taste of everything. So that is, I read that and I went, ah, yes, that is the best yeah. description. Um, but, but guys, it's actually a very uplifting story and it's an adventure. Um, it is, it's a caper. 
I know that we talked a lot about the um, mental illness side of the book today, but it is, it's actually a very fun adventure story. There's like a road trip story. Code cracking and breaking and entering and- Yes, there's and there's a-, great a character, There's a great character named Jif Higgins, who's maybe my favorite character in this oh, book. Oh, he's fantastic. Wacky, he's eccentric magic collector that they have to like bribe. It's so, it's so much fun. Yes, and, it is. It's a super fun book to read, and um, and, and she it, has a she has an online only asexual best friend yes. who I really love. Um, the characters are fantastic. You did you. a incredible job of making and making every character count because there's not a lot of characters in this book, um, and I feel like when there's not a lot of characters, you have to like work a little harder to make sure that they're all interesting and well-rounded and there's nobody who you're like me they're they're all fantastic i really love thank it thank you thank okay you. so it is 651 okay let's do this fast and then maybe we'll have time for some because i see there's a bunch of questions that popped up oh. in the question thing okay so here's what we're going to do my wife is upstairs and she's paying attention to the comments don't do this yet wait until i say ready set go here's what's going to happen in a moment, I'm gonna reveal the first card that I chose, okay? You are, well, before I do that, I want you to close your eyes right now and think of a card. Think of the number and the suit. So Jack of Diamonds, Seven of Hearts, whatever it is, hold that thought in your mind. What's gonna happen in a second is you're gonna type your card into the comments. I'm gonna pull this card and the first person to name the card will win all three books. It's winner take all. I'm going to hold the books the right side up. All three books and a, a copy of Anna's book, Learning Not to Drown, signed by herself and her husband, Mike Shinoda. So, ready, set, type in your card right now. And I'm going to wait one minute and then I will pluck the card from the wall. Right now, my wife is frantically taking screenshots so she can keep track of everyone's <laughs> card. So while we're doing that, uh, should we take an audience uh, question? Sure, we can do that. All right, so I'm gonna tap the question thing and, uh, and uh, 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 there you go. Okay. Oh, we both led. Yeah, you both led fascinating lives. Do you think that's a necessity to tell a good story? I do not. Do you? I agree. If you have a rich imagination and you have feelings, that's all it takes, right? You know what I love? Um, there was one author who I was talking to where they said, uh, "Follow your curiosity when you're Ooh. writing," and and I think that that was Ruta. Um, Sepetis, is that how you say your last name? I don't know, but Sepetis, I don't know. Sepetis, maybe, but she's a fantastic writer too. But she, uh, I believe that she said, follow your curiosity. Huh. And, um, and I think if you're curiosity quote. about, if you're curious about something like dive in and research it, um, there are a lot of places that will be like, come learn about this thing at my, my space. I would love to teach you about metal work or whatever it might be. Huh. Okay. So do you want to do the, uh, has it been a minute? We... Yes. Yes. It's been a minute. All right. Ami, it's time for you to get ready to search through those quotes, those comments. The card is the eight of diamonds. So if anyone has selected the eight of diamonds, you just won. My wife is now going to go through the comments and let us know. Uh, should we do another question while we're waiting for that to happen? Sure. Do, uh, do we want to do, because I did have two of these. So oh. do we want to do one more? Yeah, let's wait for her to get to, to pluck okay. out the, and she's going to like yell okay. from upstairs, eh, person. Okay. Um, um, do you want to, uh, yeah, let's do another question. Um, there we go. Any symptoms, Easter eggs, and lightness of hands? Ah. Ooh. Yes, um, the name of the town that symptoms take place is briefly referenced, and one of the mm. characters is from the town that Riley is from. Oh, that's super fun. I hear the door opening. Do we have a winner? Boo. What? Oscar Boo. Say it again. Oscar Boo. Oscar Boo. Oscar Boo, you are the winner. 
of all three of these fine books, including uh, including Anna's, and then we'll do one more to give and away the second copy of Anna's. Oscar, Sorry, it's gonna come to in two separate packages because I'm gonna be mailing this and Jeff is gonna be mailing that, so. Okay, great, that's good. And then we have one more of my book. One more, Ami. The next winner is the Six of Hearts. The Six of Hearts. Um, let's do one other, unless you have any other questions. Uh, I have a couple that have popped up here. Sure. Um, we have we have five minutes and we know that we want to end it before the live thing right, ends Before it. the live cuts out. Yeah. Uh, okay. This is a good one. How can you help someone that doesn't want to seek help? Oof, that is a good one. Um, my advice on that, okay, two things. Sometimes you have to take care of your own mental health. Um, and I, I actually had one of my closest friends that I am uh, no longer in contact with because um, she, she didn't, she couldn't stay on her mental health. And uh, this was at the time that we kind of like drifted apart was uh, probably a good 15 years ago. And um, I was trying to deal with my own stuff. I was in a really rough place of processing my childhood. And um, she wasn't staying on her medication. It was actually, she, she was bipolar and she was not staying on her medication. And she would call me at all hours of the night and have these conversations with me. And sometimes she would say like somebody's in my house or whatever it might, there was all sorts of things. And it got to the point where I couldn't help, I couldn't handle my own mental health and hers at the same time. And so I kind of just let the relationship drift apart. And I, and I had to, and sometimes I feel bad about that, but I had to do it because I had to protect myself. Yeah. Now that said, I think that, um, having somebody to support you is great. Uh, and, and if it, it, you know, if I can with somebody when they call me and they're upset about something, I'll talk to them as a friend, but sometimes they'll say, this is as far as I can go. You really need to, to get some professional help or here's a phone number for you or something like that, because I can only help so much. Do you have a, a thought about that as well? You can't, all you can do is say, I love you. I'm here for you no matter what. Call me at any time of day or night, no I matter what. I didn't do that. You. You're making me feel awful. Well, no, you, <laughs> like you said, sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can't, but yeah. um, that's all you can do. If you're dying to save that person, that's all you can do. Right. Um, okay, okay, so we're almost, uh, it's almost out of time. Uh, I want to say, Anna, thank you so much for doing this for me. Um, and making me feel safe to be able to talk about all this stuff. Absolutely. And thank all of you. Uh, Uncharted, Thief. Oh, Uncharted Thief. You have won the second book. Uncharted Thief. So here's what you do. Winners, you have to email me, jeff at jeffgarvinbooks.com. You have to email me with your mailing address, and I will send them to, uh, to Anna, and we will ship the books. Um, so thank you guys so much for coming. This was awesome. And thank, thank you for inviting me to do this, Jeff. I, I love that you uh, reached out to me and asked me to help you with this. It was my pleasure. And uh, The Lightness of Hands is on sale wherever fine books are sold. Uh, it's on sale. Uh, Barnes & Noble has been great to me. Um, you can get the ebook on Kobo. Um, and I recommend that you go to Once Upon a Time Books. If you go to my website, jeffgarvinbooks.com, you can click on it. Through the end of Friday, you can get a signed and personalized copy. That's the only place you can do it. Support indie bookstores. This is a really, really hard time for small businesses. So please support your indie bookstore. All right. Bye. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful to speak with you. And I will see you on the internet. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.